Everybody stand with me, please. Everybody stand with me all across this great tabernacle. Every time we get together, it's an opportunity for God to do something supernatural in our lives. And I thank God for the Spirit of God that abides here in this place. I thank God that you're here tonight because I believe that you're here by divine appointment. You're not here just because you decided you to come or because someone invited you. You're here for your life to be transformed by the truth. And our guest tonight is someone who is not only a defender of America's liberties on the battlefield, but he's also someone who's a defender of the truth of the Word of God. And he's been here before, but I know a lot of you have never heard him in person, but you're about to hear from him and from the Holy Ghost tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome to the platform again at World Harvest Church, Brother Dave Reaver. Well, good evening. Thank you so much. Please be seated comfortably. What a night. What music. Oh, my goodness. Just for you guys leave the platform up here, I, I want to tell you a little quick story. I was at a church once, not like this one. And the musicians got up and they said, y'all pray for us while, they, while we try to sing. They started singing and I started praying. <laughs> it was so bad. I just prayed, God, get us through this. Y'all were magnificent tonight. I wish everyone could have heard you. Thank you. You guys are spoiled around here, and you know it. Not only great music, but you got America's pastor, Rod Parsley. That's what he is. He's always been my hero, and I love him. He takes on any issue because he's not afraid of anything. He's been one of the greatest voices in American history in modern days, and I'll tell you, the enemy hates him. That's why I attacked him at his voice, trying to shut him up. Well, that didn't work. Of course, I was such a good-looking guy, the devil attacked me. <laughs> Never mind. But tonight, I'm going to share some of my personal story because a lot of us are together for the first time, but I've got some, some points I want to make that I believe are very, very apropos to this congregation, to this church. God sent us here just like you were sent, so were we. We're not went. We're sent. Big difference, amen? You just look marvelous, darling. Marvelous. I'm so glad to be back. I don't travel alone. Dave and Kathy Wampler have traveled with me for 25 years. I've known this girl since she was a baby. Her daddy and I fought in the same war. And he is one of the best friends I've ever had in my life. My motorcycle riding buddy. We've traveled all over the country on bikes. and I'm just glad to have her in this podium tonight. I want you to welcome as she comes, Kathy Wampler. And tonight, amen. oh, look at you. God bless you, God. What a kind thing. You're beautiful. I've asked Kathy to not only sing, but I want her to greet you and let her have a word of greeting. She's a great minister of the gospel. And uh, she usually is on TBN with me last night. She was not, we didn't do any music on Praise the Lord program last night, but tonight you get to hear Kathy. Here she is. Hi, Kath. Hello. Hi, how are you doing? Are you happy? You sound happy. You worship like you're happy, and I believe it. I am so grateful tonight for Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. I am so grateful for his sacrifice, for my salvation, for his healing power, for his keeping power. I'm thankful for his peace, for his joy, for his deliverance, for his love. I am thankful, thankful for Jesus, the ultimate gift. I'm so glad I know him. I'm so glad that at some point in my life, someone opened their mouth and told me about Jesus. And we need to do the same. You know, the world will throw a lot of stuff at us. And it's not all pretty. But whatever happens because of that anchor that we have in Jesus Christ, no matter what we see, no matter what we hear, no matter even what we feel, we can say, Lord, I thank you that it is well with my soul. Amen. When peace like a river, a 
sure tell who came to church tonight the Lord is in this house thank you Kathy well done you can be received Kathy's gonna help me I just want to let you know that her albums are available we're just gonna do this real quickly because this helps support the ministry just to be honest with you her album she has three beautiful albums what you feel you can plug into your car you're gonna weep a little and miss a few exits but it's a good reason also available is a brand new series that won a Telly Award. I'm happy to tell you, we can brag a little. This series is called Tragedy to Triumph. It's Warriors Stories. As many of you know, I work for the Department of Defense and I travel into all of the war zones, wherever they are in the world. And the stories that have come back to us from the young men and women who served, whether it's from the battlefield or from the hospital where they're going through recovery from traumatic injury, these stories lift up Jesus in the most powerful, powerful way. Some of you need to change your television watching habits. And we can help you do that. Buy this set of DVDs that will transform your life. I promise you. It's the most amazing television. For several years, the Telly Award Foundation people didn't even give any tellies. They said, nope, we're not giving any out. But when they saw this, 
They bellied up, and I love it. So I'm pushing a little bit there. Uh, we have a book. It's, it's my book. It's called Scarred. I don't know where that idea came from. It seemed appropriate. But I want to tell you, it's an autobiography. But I have to urgently tell you, whether it's that series for television on DVD or our books, it's not about Dave. Look at me. I'm nothing worth having but for Jesus. This is not Dave's story. It's the story of Jesus and the life of Dave, okay? Please understand, it's not self-centered, egotistical, self-righteous. This is lifting up Jesus, and it will lift you up when you get in the presence of the Lord and the power of the word of truth. A book recently came out that I finished just in time for the new television series that Trinity is using of our ministry with our warriors from all over the world. It's called war and recovery this book is filled with stories of our young warriors that have come back from Saudi Arabia Kuwait Oman Qatar UAE Afghanistan Iraq and all the places I've gone in to minister to our troops when you read their stories and some of my own that I never shared I held it too close but I would listen to them be so vulnerable I was embarrassed that I was not willing to be as open and I've shared a few things that go back in my history that were dynamic turning points between me and God out of the tragedy of the battlefield. That book is filled with scriptures of confirmation and affirmation that will apply into your life because, listen to my words, you don't have to go to war to get hurt. I went to war, got hurt, and I ended up, came back with a purple heart. Some of you go to divorce court and you came back with a broken heart and a broken washer and the X got the dryer and it worked. Life's not fair, is it? This book can transform your life. I'm flat out telling you the truth. It will so amaze you. The stories, the interest that you have in the freedom of America will peak as you read that book. Finally, I'm still going in public schools. I'm 69 going on 40, 40 is a new 20. I'm 19 according to Common Core Math. I still do public schools and we're reaching these kids all over America. This book is filled with stories of the kids. Some of these stories will absolutely, I'm telling you now, it'll break your heart. It will break your heart. Not all of them made it. But when you read the whole story, the whole book, you'll see why I do what I do in public schools. In fact, Tomorrow, I'm speaking to 7,000 students from the Ohio Public Schools. Tomorrow, I have those kids right here in your city in Columbus. I ain't done yet. I got a long ways down this road to go. Finally, this is, this is an honor of Pastor Parsley. We're trying to help the man. Live your life so the preacher won't have to lie at your funeral. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, guys. Y'all are so thoughtful. Thanks, man. You know what? Whoever around here taught you, they taught you right. You know how to treat a lady. You know how to give them a hand down off these steps. I love it. I just love it when people do what's right. Nowadays, you're called heroes if you just do what's right. If you take all three of those books, I'm going to throw something in for you. It's our 24-carat nylon bracelet. <laughs> It's made of what they call 550 cord, 550 pound tensile strength parachute cord, braided into a little bracelet. I usually wear mine, but I have a blood clot in my arm, and it sometimes swells my arm up, and I can't wear it right now. But mine was given to me by my medic in Iraq. Captain Jamie Rath put it on me, and he said, pray for me. And I said, I will, and I'm going to remember you, Jamie, and you're going to come home with all your fingers and toes and a sound mind, because our troops are covered when we pray for them. God sends his angels to be with our troops. Do not fail to pray for our troops. Every day you need to call them out in prayer. But this will help remind you to do that. And if you take all three books, I'm gonna give this to you, but inside is a card and it's not a gimmick. Let me tell you right now, you do not have to put any of your contact information. That's not what the card's about. What I want you to do on that card is write to a warrior and say thank you and something good about Jesus. I've carried these into the battlefields, into hell holes of this world you would not believe. And I've watched combat hardened American soldiers sit down with tears in their eyes as they read the simple words of somebody back home 
that they didn't even know, saying, thank you, and Jesus loves you. Any way you want to say that. And then, if you would, do that tonight before you leave. If you want one of these and you don't care to buy all three books, it's a $10 scholarship fund, and it pays for the warriors to come through our program that the Department of Defense sends to me while they're still on active duty, having been wounded. They come with no legs, and we put them back on their feet. You know what I mean? That's my job, and I love my job. So do that, and I will gladly see to it that you get that card through my hands into the hands of a warrior. They're going to bring me a place to sit here in a second. I think somebody's lined up to help me with that. It's there. Oh, oh, it's behind. The, you know what? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, thanks, boss. If you'll put that right up here. Uh, I, I, I have to confess to you, I'm a little bit weak still. I had uh, back surgery. Thanks, sir. I appreciate that very much. And uh, I have a steel leg thing now that helps me. It runs underneath my foot. This is funny. It runs underneath my foot, up my leg to an artificial knee, which goes to an artificial back. I have 12 screws and two rods, which goes to an artificial chest that holds me together with steel mesh that leads to an artificial bracket that holds my ear on because it's artificial, holds my glasses, and they made me an eyelid two months ago that's perfectly clear, and I can see through it without any pain after 46 years of suffering. What do you think of that? Isn't that a great story? I mean, it's just, I'm not through yet. You know why? Look here. I got a hairpiece. <laughs> Blew my hair off in Vietnam, but I got my hair back. I bought it, and there's, there's a guy in China wondering why he's bald and I'm not. I got his hair. He was old. He, I'm not this gray. You didn't get that. That's all right. We'll work with it. They're going to make a, they're going to open an Ace Hardware at the cemetery when I die. All these parts and screws and rods and you can build in the car engine out of me. <laughs> I'm having fun. I hope it's all right. You guys are, you're, you're, you're alive. You're so quick. You catch everything. It's because you've been trained to listen and you've been trained to let your spirit respond to exciting news and joyful things and spiritual truth so anyway if you don't mind i'll sit down every now and then and stand up every now and then and because my back still has some of those back cramps from the surgery but i'm doing great i have no complaints okay uh and so i i, I have a scripture if you don't mind i'll read it and i have my phone because it did y'all know that if you put your fingers on the screen and spread them apart it makes great big letters. <laughs> My grandson showed me that. I'm going to read from uh, the book of Hebrews. And it's just a, it's a few scriptures, but it's worth reading. But I want to, I want to springboard off of that, all right? Verse 32 of Hebrews chapter 11. Okay, Hebrews 11, 32. And... What shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and the prophets who through faith, get this, now listen, subdued kingdoms. Now that's pretty serious stuff there. It's not like they won the, the, the battle of the local block for a gang war. They subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of the, of the fire. Boy, I wish they'd been around when I was in Vietnam. Quenched the violence of fire, escaped, you know, I do know that when I get to heaven, Jesus says, well done. <laughs> hmm. I could settle for medium well or... <laughs> Escape the edge of the sword. Boy, that's me. I escaped the edge of a 7.62 bullet out of the tip end of a AK-47. Out of weakness were made strong. There I am again. I'm strong, but not in myself. My weakness is made strong through Christ. We're made strong. Uh, waxed valiant in fight. Turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again and others. 
Last night as I was hosting on Trinity Broadcasting, I had this scripture come to me as I was there. I, didn't, I wasn't even prepared for it, but the Lord put it in my heart, and I wanted to share it with you tonight. I had the audience there say what I'm going to ask you to say, those two words. After all that you've just heard, the mighty work of God through the mighty men and women of God, it says, and others. Say it with me. And others. We're tortured. While we're sitting here tonight, comfortable in this magnificent, beautiful sanctuary, comforted out of the rain, some of our brothers and sisters tonight are being beheaded, are being crucified, are being set on fire in cages, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better a resurrection. And others, say it again, and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings yea moreover bonds and imprisonment they were stoned they were sawn asunder were tempted were slain with the sword they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins being desolate destitute afflicted tormented of whom the world was not worthy that's an amazing statement. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And these all, not some a part of lots of all, having obtained a good report through faith. They were all faithful. Received not the promise. I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes God answers our prayers and sometimes we think he doesn't but he always answers prayer. It may not be the way we think it ought to be. And if he had my opinion on everything, when he pretty much gets it, but it doesn't mean much to him because it's his opinion that counts. Have you ever prayed for something and God didn't answer the way you wanted? And it kind of ticked you off, didn't it? You ever have to forgive God for not doing it your way? The number one song at funerals in America today is, I did it my way. I wonder if old Blue Eyes is singing that song now. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Our way leads to destruction. God's way leads to eternal life in the presence of the angels of God and all the spirits of just men made perfect. So you're looking at a guy tonight that from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, literally, is scarred, mutilated, and got all the spare parts. And I put them on the bed the other day, and my wife said good night, and I was in the other room. <laughs> that's a joke. That didn't happen. I, that's, that's a joke. I'll tell you when it's a joke. Some of you are looking at me saying, Alice, he lost more than his face. <laughs> I do not have Dame Bramage. But you know something? On July the 26th, 1969, on the bank of a river called the Vam Cote in an area of Vietnam nicknamed the Parrot's Beak, right on the border with Cambodia, the devil lowered the boom. He aimed, fired his best shot, and he hit me. Knocked me halfway into eternity. But I'm still here because no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. Don't you get it? It's not about Dave Reaver. It's about Jesus Christ. Give it up in the house of God for the Son of God. Oh, I love to hear you. Listen at that sound. Woo, thank you, Lord. Wow. What an awesome sound to hear you shout like that. You know what? You just, you just lowered the temperature in hell a little bit. I've always wondered what happened to the guy that invented air conditioning. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing if he went to hell and for eternity all he could do is say to the devil, I can fix this, I can fix this, I can fix it. Wow, that would be hell on its own. Well, I'll tell you what God fixed. He had a broken heart in me. My mother, when I was born, my mother almost died and never recovered and was downhill till the point she ended up curled up in a fetal position in her nursing home. They rolled her over one day, all 68 pounds of her, to change her diaper. When they rolled her back, she didn't live there anymore. 
Her body was there, what was left of it, but her precious spirit, that until the day she could no longer speak, she communicated to me the truths of God's word. And out of her tragedy, I found my triumph because in all the time that she suffered, I never once, never once heard her ever say, why me, God? And I don't recommend you say it either because I'm going to tell you something. What would happen if you said, why me, God, and he told you why? What if he answered you? That's a thought. Why me, God? I don't know, George. Just something about you I don't like. <laughs> if your name's George, I would change the name to protect the guilty. Everybody, read what's left of my lips. Everybody gets hurt. That's not the question in life. The great question of life is, when you get hurt, how are you going to deal with it? Who's your daddy now? Who are you going to blame? Why me, God? No. God didn't do this to Dave Reaver. Look at me. God didn't shoot me. He didn't set me on fire on that riverbank that day on July 26, 1969. I hate to say 69 with all the young people here. I know you think that's right after the War of 1812. <laughs> it was after, but not right after. But I got to tell you something. I struggled with one big question. I knew God didn't do it to me, so I didn't say, why me, God? That never entered my mind. But it did enter my mind, why didn't he who did not do this to me, yet could put the moon in space, why didn't he stop a little 7.62 bullet from the end of an AK-47 going through the back of my hand and blowing a grenade I was trying to throw? I wasn't even throwing it at any individual. I was trying to burn down some high brush. It was a white phosphorus grenade, burns at about 5,000 degrees, I've been told. That's Fahrenheit, that's hot, Bubba. Twice the heat necessary to melt the engine out of your car, and it blew six inches from my right ear or less. Right here. My left hand was elevated slightly, exploded, blew my left thumb off, burned off the tips of my fingers. My right hand was severed in half, my thumb and three fingers hanging by tendons. One finger was left attached to my preaching finger. Repent! <laughs> and these fingers don't work. They make a good mic stand. Y'all think I'm nuts. I'm going to tell you something. Put what I just said together. A preacher finger, a microphone like your pastor's got on this, this drive you've got going. And I got the right message at the right time in the right place to the right people. We're going to have the right results and the devil's on the run. We're going to keep him that way. He ruse the day he touched my life. But God said, you can't kill him. He tried his best, but God said, not now. Because God gave me this life and the devil can't take it away. God gave you your life, the devil can't take it away. So don't give it up to him. Yeah. I remember kissing my little teenage wife goodbye. I met her when I was 16. I asked her to marry me. She slapped me. And she, she said, I'm only 13. I said, but you have the body of a 14-year-old. <laughs> she slapped me again. I used the word body, TMI. You know what that means? Too much information. She said, this is not Kentucky and I'm not your first cousin. I said, does that constitute a no? She said, if you love me, you'll wait for me. Thank God for the word if. I said, I love you. I'll wait for you. I'll pick you up at 10. <laughs> I knew what she meant. For all of you that find this shocking, do you have pew belts to hold you in the seat there? We were both virgin when we married. What do you think of that? We waited. And I got to admit, more for her sake than my own because I was a typical boy possessed with the urge to merge and she was not so possessed and she kept the water on this fire and we waited and then one day after we got married I was going to Bible college studying for the ministry you learn how to say it that way in Bible college ministry <laughs> I got a little notice in the mail to go take a physical Uncle Sam said I want you go take your physical I wrote back and told him how much I appreciated his inquiry about my health, but I was fine. <laughs> he insisted I take that physical, which I did, and it's the only exam I passed that whole semester. I got no plus on the blood test. <laughs> you get it? Oh, oh, positive, yeah. And they told me I was going to be inducted in the Army. I rushed right out and joined the Navy. I didn't want to get hurt serving in the military. 
Well, that worked out great, didn't it? I got up one morning and had a bad year. I will never regret that day. And what I'm going to say, I don't know what your position. I had a man stop me yesterday, looked at me, and he said, I hate war, and I'm a conscientious objector, and I did not go. I said, well, aren't you glad somebody did to give you right to be a conscientious objector? I've got no problem with conscientious objection if they'll do something for their country to make up, to do something for those that will put their life on the line. And so I'm going to say this to you. I'm proud of my scars and stripes for my country. I'm proud to be a Vietnam veteran. I'm in Ohio. Look here. I want the world to see. I'm, in, I'm at World Harvest Church. Look at this crowd. I love you people. You're, you're absolutely wonderful. Woo. So, no regrets. But on that day, July 26, 1969, that grenade exploded. I looked down, my face was on my boots. I could see my heart beating. And like I said, I got my hair back. <laughs> it was blown off the other day in a high wind. <laughs> you ever chase your hair across the parking lot? You ever have a dog beat you to it? You ever have a dog bring it to you? This thing gets really embarrassing real quick. My ear fell off one night when I was preaching in Jamaica. I didn't know it fell off. It just peeled off like a wet band-aid. It's laying on my shoulder, and I didn't know it, but I knew something was wrong. Thousands of people all doing the same thing. So I checked my fly. <laughs> I did. It was good. I looked around. Oh, no. There's my ear. Laying them, I picked it up, dried the sweat, stuck it back on. It got worse. They thought it was a miracle, and they all got saved. And that is a true story. And I couldn't tell them it was a phony ear. They would have thought I was a phony evangelist and they would have stoned me. Pastor Parsley did not want me coming here telling you, I went to Jamaica and I got stoned. <laughs> There's something wrong with the way that sounds. helicopter landed to pick me up. I jumped off my little fiberglass riverboat. I was in what was called the U.S. Navy Special Operations Warfare Command, SWC, Special Warfare Command. We were known as SWIC. Now, today, the Brownwater Black Beret, which I was, are now called Special Boat Teams, and they made movies about us. They did. One was called Apocalypse Now, and the other, more recently, called Acts of Valor. And I was the forward gunner on that little fiberglass riverboat that would run like a scalded dog through that river. It was fast. That was our defense. Because fiberglass isn't going to stop a pistol, much less a B-40 anti-tank rocket propelled grenade. And on that day, I thought I was hit by a rocket. I didn't know I was hit by a sniper blowing my own grenade. I just knew my world changed in one second. And I jumped in the water. I continued to burn in the water. My skin everywhere. I'm beside myself <laughs> come on now that right there is funny I don't care who you are I need to pull myself together <laughs> you got it you guys are quick over here I crawled up on the banks of the river I'm looking at the damage and I fell over backwards and they all thought I was dead and I was listed as KIA killed in action and a guy tried to sell me a car the other day spelled KIA <laughs> do not buy that. that thing will kill you <laughs> no, it's a great car. It's really beautiful. I wish I could afford one. But here's what happened. The helicopter picked me up. They put me on a stretcher to put me in the helicopter. I caught the stretcher on fire. Water cannot extinguish white phosphorus. It has to burn itself out. So when they put me on the stretcher, it caught fire, ripped open, I fell through on my head. Have you ever had one of those days? <laughs> Nothing goes right. They rolled me up, got me on another stretcher in the helicopter, and away we go. And the medics filled out my death report, and under the blanket I said, Medic! And he almost jumped out of the helicopter. The pilot lost control. We're dropping like a rock, and I thought, Good Lord, we're going to crash, and I'll be the only survivor. <laughs> they got me to Saigon and then to Japan. And pardon me if I speak a little quickly, because I'm going to get it in by, within my lot of time, because I know there's other events we have to consider, like getting your kids out of here without tearing up the church. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. But I got to tell you something, man. When they took me to Japan, I did something really stupid. I asked for a mirror, and they did something really stupid. They brought it, and they held it over my face. I had one good eye to see with. I looked up, and I knew my junior high school sweetheart, not my high school sweetheart only, 
She was my junior high school sweetheart. I knew it was over. There is not a living teenager in the world could love what I saw in that mirror. And I knew that I'd lose her. So I decided to get me out of her misery and I tried to take my life. I tried to kill myself that day. I'm in a hospital. How do you kill yourself? I had no gun, no knife, no razor blades, no pills. But there was a tube and that's all I needed. I pulled the tube. I laid my head back, folded my hands and I waited to die. And I got hungry. <laughs> really bad timing. It's the wrong tube. I pulled out lunch. Now, you can kill yourself that way, but it's going to take a while. And if you smell one pizza, you're singing that little song, plug it in, plug it in. You don't want to die. I want to tell you, some of you in this room right now know exactly what I'm talking about when I say sometimes life is more scary than death. But I want you to read these lips again. Don't do it. Don't pull that trigger. Don't pull that tube. Don't you give up. Tomorrow is another chance. For one second past midnight, His mercies are new every day. Give God a chance to change your life. Wow. I got chewed out. That doctor chewed me out good. But they sent me to America, to Brook Army Medical Center. I was there for a year and two months. Thirteen of us in the room, twelve died. I don't know of any of them that survived but me. And I was not 100% third degree. I was almost 50% third degree. But the head damage from the explosion, traumatic brain injury, was their primary concern. So they put me in what we call death row. That was the ICU of the ICU. They put the worst of the worst in there. So when we died, we didn't discourage people that had a chance. So we got in there and discouraged each other to death. And my first day there, they let visitors come in. A woman walked straight over to the guy in the bed next to mine. She looked at him. He's 100% guaranteed to die. Nobody's ever survived 100% third degree. Took off her wedding ring, threw it on the bed. And she said, you're embarrassing. I couldn't walk down the street with you and walked out. And all I could do was just horrified, suck air. <gasps> and I decided I needed to try one more time. Take my life before that little teenager could walk in that room, but I didn't have time. The door opened and it was her turn next. And I read her lips when she said to the doctor and he pointed at me and said, that's your husband. She said, that's not my husband. And my heart broke and I knew my greatest fear had come upon me. She would leave me and I'd be alone. From the girl I loved from the time I was 16. I didn't want to lose her. And I still have an ache inside from that day. And he walked up and he said to her, that is your husband. She said, no, it's not. And they took, he walked her up to the pillow and there I am. She is face to face with me. And he turns my wrist and there's my name. But it was something she saw as she looked into the window of my soul. And she said, that is him. And she bit down and kissed my face, the worst burned part of my body. And she looked me in that eye and she said, I just want you to know I love you. Welcome home, Davy. And when she says, Davy, <laughs> I said, Doc, I'm getting better. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, I can't look good for you anymore. She said, Davy, you never were good looking. <laughs> Listen to you, you guys are cold. <laughs> you shall know the truth and the truth shall tick thee off. But it will set you free. I left the hospital with suitcase in one hand, sweetheart in the other. And I had the privilege of a lifetime in a nation I loved to preach all over our country and around the world in the greatest venues on this planet, exposed on all the great networks, the big talk shows of our day. And yet, I did not know that I had not successfully and 
totally buried something that would be resurrected on September 11, 2001. And it was in this church I spoke my first time after September 11, 2001. In fact, I had to drive from Canada. They wouldn't let us bring our aircraft across the border because it was under such tight control. And I came to this church and Rod Parsley believed in me and let me be a voice in a time of struggle in America not known since Pearl Harbor. I love your pastor. He trusted me that day. What a man. What a huge man of God. And so quickly, so my time won't run out, I want to tell you, from that day, that day my life changed. I tried to join the military, and they said, you're already 100% permanent and total disabled. You can't serve. I said, my trigger finger works. They said no, but two weeks later I got a call from the Department of Defense at Langley and they said, we do want you, not in uniform of our services, but we want you to contract with the Department of Defense and we'll send you to every installation in this country. And they did. And then they said, we want to send you downrange. And they did to Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Afghanistan, Iraq, and other points of high interest. And in doing so, I was given the chance of a lifetime to serve my country again as what I mentioned earlier, as a resiliency coach. And today, I look back at over 7 million students I spoke to in public schools and quit counting four years ago at 7 million and still going. And no matter where they send me to our troops, never without exception, it always happens. Someone comes up and says, you came to my school. And I remember every word you said. It's okay with me, except when it's a 30-year colonel. Yeah, you came to my school and I was in junior high. I said, shut up. <laughs> I can't be I'm that old, but I am. And still going. And as soon as this steel rod comes off this leg, I'll be back into Afghanistan to complete my mission before it's time for me to go home. I am not through. I've got a job to do for the kingdom of God and I will be successful in that job. I will not be denied my destiny. So with that said, I'd like to close by telling you this and then I have a little short video I'd like to show you. It's only a few minutes long. But recently I was asked to do a, a tour across America for DOD. And it started on the East Coast, and for time's sake, instead of explaining what all the tour meant, across the country, I'm only going to pick one isolated place, and it was the first one on the East Coast. And it was at the National Mortuary. It's going to be hard for me to share this, but I'm going to pull this off. I'm going to do it. I spoke for NSA and for Fort Meade, the intelligence community of the military, I spoke also for the Air Force that was there. And uh, one other, trying to think who the other organization was. It slips me right now, but it was uh, Mortuary Affairs, the United States Air Force. And a colonel came up to me and he said, have you ever been through the National Mortuary? I said, no, thank God. He said, I know what you mean, but you want to go through? I said, well, you give me a tour. He said, I'll take you there. So we went over and we went into the autopsy room to it, didn't go in it. I stopped at the threshold and he said, you want to come in? I said, no. I'm an Old Testament student of the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies was a place a man did not belong if he wasn't trained and of the right descent to be there. And I said, I have no training. He said, there's no one on the table. I said, it doesn't matter. That is a place of honor and valor and I don't belong there gawking. He said, Thank you, Mr. Reaver. I said, but Colonel, is this not the most difficult assignment you've ever been given in service to your country? He said, it's difficult, but this place, no, not the worst. Come, he said, I'll take you there. And he took me over to another room. And it was about half the size of this auditorium. And it was completely filled with uniforms hanging in perfect space between each other. And no lint or dust or anything. Everything was perfect. And I thought, well, for the base exchange, they must store uniforms here. When you're not used to being in a mortuary, you're not used to death. And before I made a fool of myself, he, 
he saw I was confused. He said, every one of these uniforms will sooner or later be put on the remains of someone who loved you, Dave Reaver, loved me in this country more than themselves. These are burial shrouds. I shuddered. I felt myself shudder like a chill hit me. I said, so this is the place that's the most difficult. He said, not here. Come, he said, I'll take you there. And he took me over to a place called the Fisher House. And all you military know what I'm talking about. The Fisher House was built by Arnold Fisher, the old, well, he's passed now, but from World War II. He was an industrialist that wanted to show honor to the families of our fallen. And he built these homes in different places for those families to have a place of consul and consolation to be counseled and loved and, and treated with respect prior to the arrival of the remains of their loved one. It was one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen in my life. And as I beheld, I said, is this that spot? No, he said, come here. I'll take you there. And he took me over to a little ante room off the chapel. And when I looked in, no one had to tell me where I was this time. I saw the giant stuffed panda bear the little Tonka toy trucks. You know where I was. This is where the children were taken and daddy's remains were coming in and sometimes mama's remains. Because you may not know, many women have died for our country, for our freedom in this very war on terror. And I'm going to tell you what I saw in that room broke me. It was a little blackboard, not eye level to an adult, but it was down eye level to a child. And what was written on that blackboard would break me. My mommy means the world to me. The child who would never again be comforted in the lap in the arms of a mom that she was born to. And through my tears I said, Colonel, sir, is this not the most difficult place you've ever been to? Is this not the most difficult assignment? He said, this one is very difficult, but come. I'll take you there. And he took me to the flight line where the giant C-5A comes in or the C-130 lands and that huge cavernous aircraft that carries other aircraft. It can carry tanks and trucks and all kinds of foodstuffs for the war. But the most precious cargo it would ever carry would come in on what's nicknamed the Angel Flight. That's the flight that I escorted across the war zones of the Middle East all the way to Baghdad, but never from Baghdad to the mortuary. Dover Air Force Base and Dover, Delaware is a place that understands every word coming out of my mouth. They deal with these amazing people who give their lives for our freedom. And the most precious cargo that would ever be carried on the Angel Flight was not another aircraft or helicopter. It was that little box in the middle of the floor strapped to that floor that would one day be called a coffin in only a few days hence. And in would march those that would pick that thing up and carry it to a waiting truck that has not a, not a chip of paint. The tires glisten, the wheels are shined. Everything is as beautiful as it can be made. And a rope with giant hooks on either end hanging on golden stands would separate a family that's about to have a train run smack over them when that coffin, as we call it, comes out and placed in the back of that truck. And as it takes off down the street to the mortuary, something drastic takes place. I said, Colonel, what is it? He said, sometimes we have a runner. I said, what's a runner? Colonel, what's a runner? He said, Dave, that's when mama can't take it anymore. She jumps the rope and when the truck takes off down the street, she takes off chasing it. No more logic. Doesn't matter what's common sense. She just wants her baby back. She wants to touch him and hold him one more time. I said, what do you do, Colonel? He said, I have to jump that rope too and I have to catch her. I said, what do you do when you catch her? He said, I just hold her. He said, what do you say to her? And this is what he said to me. Mr. Reaver, in 30 years of my career for my country, the most difficult thing I've ever been assigned to do is to hold her and say nothing because there's nothing I can say to bring her baby back. I close this evening 
with a question. Have you ever chased a truck? I have. And I am. And I chased it right through this church in Ohio tonight. It's a truck named America. And in the back lie the remains of a nation I once knew where a child could pray in school and a red-faced bully atheist wouldn't scream and say, you're violating the separation clause of the First Amendment, which is a lie because the Supreme Court ruled that child does not leave his or her rights at the schoolhouse gate when they walk onto that property. That baby can carry that Bible and can read and pray if they choose to, and nobody can take that right away from. Some of us have bled and burned to protect it. I want my baby back. <laughs> to conclude, this little short video says it better than myself, and I want to thank your audiovisual department for having it ready. Please understand that when you see these images, you'll see the places I go in Afghanistan and Iraq. You will understand. When you see me in battle rattle, as they call it, you won't see me handling a gun. I won't be carrying a gun. I have Navy SEALs. I have Delta Force. I have Rangers. I have people that are my bodyguards. But you will see me in places of difficulty. You'll also see the ranches that we built that Department of Defense sends our magnificent heroes to us for their healing emotionally and spiritually. And you will see the cost of freedom. Thank you for allowing me to show you this video.
Tower, good afternoon. Angel Flight Bravo 03. Gear down, five miles. We have a hero on board tonight. Angel Flight Bravo 02, you are number one for landing. Welcome home. There's one more angel flight coming. It's not the one that brings us from the battlefield to Ohio, but from this battlefield of earth to a place called heaven. And the angel of the Lord shall descend. The trump shall sound, and the Lord will descend, and we'll be caught up together, escorted, I believe, by angels. To a place we call home and if you're not ready make tonight your salvation election sure join me as a congregation renew your vows and if you haven't made the vows make them now say it with me Lord Jesus you're in the house I know where I am I'm in your presence in your house you know my heart tonight my desire is to serve you unashamed. Forgive me of all my sin. Prepare me for an eternity to serve you. I declare this day, by your death and resurrection, my sins are forgiven. And my resurrection will be that great day when I stand before you unafraid because that day I will be like you face to face no longer trying to get there I will be there thank you Jesus for the angel flight home amen amen celebrate the house celebrate Jesus ladies and gentlemen it has been my esteemed privilege to stand here tonight I honor your pastor I love him deeply. You are a blessed church. I'm going to go back and I'm going to sign some books should you take me up on my offer to buy some of those materials. Every dollar from everything I have ever produced goes directly into the ministry to help these warriors. I have not, will not, and I do not now take any royalties. Every gift. You can use your credit card even, or your bank or your neighbor's card. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> You can write a check. I love you. My name is Dave Reaver, and I approve of this message. Come on, let's thank Brother Dave Reaver for coming by and encouraging us tonight. Hallelujah. Love you. Praise God. Stretch your hand this way. Heavenly Father, thank you for this gift, your servant. And we thank you, Lord God, for strengthening him. We thank you for completing the work that you've begun in him, of healing him inside and out. And we thank you, Lord God, for strengthening him to fulfill his purpose in the days to come in a greater measure than he ever dreamed possible. In the mighty name of Jesus, somebody say amen.